lakes and streams, pines full of the wildest life and possibility. I say one Mississippi, there's a magnolia tree. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. From the Foundation Studio right here on Biloxi's Back Bay, welcome to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime, the world-class outdoors of the state of Mississippi. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi radio network or on Super Talk TV at C Spire TV. But if you're listening on Facebook or YouTube or your favorite podcast, it is August the 22nd, 2022. Uh, I'm going to get to my first guest in a second, but my first guest actually made me a little bit nostalgic. What it made me want to do is actually go back and see what I said when I started this show back in October. That, you know, I wanted to be reminded of the words that I used. And one of the things that I talked about uh, at the very beginning was that this is this vast state that's so diverse when you think about enjoying the outdoors from, from the hills of northeast Mississippi uh, to the fertile alluvium soils of the Mississippi Delta where I have a, a very special place called Delta uh, Delta Bluffs Hunting Club, or down to coastal Mississippi, where I'm actually doing this show right here on Biloxi's Back Bay. Um, it, we're very lucky to live in this special state. And like so many people who listen to this show, I grew up uh, in the outdoors, you know, hunting and fishing with my dad and my grandfathers. So many Mississippians, so many people in the deep south, and really, frankly, so many people across America have a very similar story. I often said about the outdoors that it that it saved me. Uh, you know, as a kid, it kept me out of trouble. As an adult, it kept me focused and gave me an opportunity to sort of clear my head. And I quoted a uh, John Muir, the 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 famous conservationist, a great great quote. He says, "Into the forest I go to find my soul, and excuse me, to lose my mind and find my soul." I, I love that saying. You know, we started this show back in October because we wanted to celebrate the vast natural resources that make Mississippi so special, and more importantly, create this awesome connection that so many of us have to the outdoors. You know, one of the things that actually drove my success in media, uh, I had the opportunity to retire in, in 2016 and uh, started a show on the coast called Coast View in, in uh, 2020. But I wanted boats and I wanted hunting ground. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a place up in the Mississippi Delta. And I knew that I wanted to be able to share those things with my family. And I believe to the bottom of my heart and my soul that a family that enjoys the outdoors together stays together. So, you know, if you think about the outdoors is the one thing that allows us to transcend political beliefs. I mean, the one time when we can all be together, as Steve Azar says in our theme song, One Mississippi, and now the state song from Mississippi, uh, from Mississippi um, you know, that's the one time we can be one. That's a magnet that keeps us here. It's a magnet that draws us into its enjoyment. Uh, the outdoors is very special. You know, if there's a driving force about this show, it's about the collective connection that we all, we all have to the outdoors. And that's what Super Talk Outdoors is all about. Now, my guest today wrote a book. He wrote a book that applies to just about anyone in America who feels this sense of uh, connection to the outdoors in your heart and soul. Um, but he particularly focuses the book on America's Deep South, which is really, really special. Uh, I want to welcome to Super Talk Outdoors Donald Jackson, the author and, and, uh, of a very critically acclaimed book called A Sportsman's Journey. I think this is going to probably be the first of many conversations that, that Donald Jackson and I have. Good morning and welcome to Super Talk Outdoors. Good morning, Ricky. It's my pleasure to be here with you all. Well, look, you've written other books, and you've, uh, you've, you've literally done a lifetime of teaching people the enjoyment of outdoors in a professional sense. Why don't you give people a little bit of a sense of your background? Well, I'm a native of Arkansas, and when you're from that part of the world, you kind of have a restless gene anyway. So I was always out rambling around on, on the water and in the woods and uh, trying to find a compass bearing, and uh, it seemed like inevitably I was going to end up in natural resources management. So after a sojourn through the University of Arkansas and a PhD at, at Auburn University, I became a, a professor of fisheries management at Mississippi State University. It's kind of, it wasn't as direct as that may sound. I ventured off into the Peace Corps for a couple of years in Southeast Asia. 
And uh, I even went to seminary up in Kentucky and was the pastor of a church up in northern Kentucky before I did my Ph.D. But uh, most of the work that I have done here in Mississippi and around the world, frankly, has been uh, with rivers. Uh, I've done a lot of work with floodplain rivers, particularly and and the fisheries that are associated with them and the people. Uh, and also I uh, work with dams and the tail waters down below the dams. Those are pretty special places for people to go fishing. But uh, so, um, some people ask me why I went into fisheries and not wildlife. And I, and I said, well, because I'm a fisheries biologist, I just get to hunt more. <laughs> That's great. But you had a great career at Mississippi State, didn't you? Well, I had a good time. I, I'll leave it to others to determine whether it was great or not. But I had a wonderful time. I spent 27 and a half years on the faculty at Mississippi State. I really didn't plan to stay that long. I, I came from Alaska. I was on the faculty at the University of Alaska and had an opportunity to come back down to the Deep South where I had a lot of family and friend connections. And uh, so uh, it's been wonderful. I ended up with a lot of graduate students that worked with me. They never worked for me. We were a good team, and I'm very proud of them. They've scattered out across the world. A lot of them have very wonderful positions in state and federal agencies. Some of them went into academics and their professors and department heads and so forth. And I'm real proud of them. They, I'm proud to say that every single one of my students did a better job in graduate school than I did. <laughs> you know what's interesting, though? I, on this show, I have the opportunity to talk to people who have dedicated their lives to conservation and the outdoors, our enjoyment of the outdoors, and so many different roles. You know, it could be as you pointed out, it could be with a federal agency. It could be in private practice of some sort. It could be working for the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. But, you know, there's a common thread often between all of these uh, people, and that is that so many of them came through Mississippi State, and so many of them are so extraordinarily well prepared for their careers. And they're making – I mean, we're very lucky in Mississippi to have so many dedicated professionals focused on making sure that we leave some legacy to our kids and our kids' kids around the outdoors. It's got to make someone like you who's had so much impact and inspiration over so many young people, it's got to make you proud. Well, it certainly does, but it's a team effort. It, as you mentioned, it's not just about the people like myself that work specifically in academics. <clears throat> it's it's the people that are involved with things like the Mississippi Wildlife Federation and the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, the USDA Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service and Natural Resource Conservation and so forth. It's all of us working together with a common thread. We I think we all hear the same song and we probably all have the same prayer that we'll end up with better relationships with our outdoors. There is no doubt. I think we probably do hear that similar song. And you know, in that song, you might hear a turkey gobble, or you might hear a Drake Mallard, or you might hear just a dead calm, you know, and what a beautiful song that is that nature has. And you, you heard me, you know, talk a little bit about the beginning of my show, but, you know, when I started back in October of last year with Super Talk Outdoors, but, you know, there is a... There is a kinship we have in Mississippi. I, I know this is true of anyone who loves the outdoors, but I'm speaking specifically in Mississippi. There's a kinship that we have with the outdoors that uh, people who may not understand it can't really appreciate how deep it is, can they? I would agree with you, absolutely. I think if we try to negate that kinship, it's like we have this rope that's tied around our heart. <laughs> And uh, if we pull too strong, it'll just pull our hearts out. So we might as well quit pulling and just come together and and, and let that rope wrap itself around us and go after things that we think are very valuable and important in almost a sacramental way. I mean, it, it takes us into the realms of understanding and meaning that uh, just don't seem to exist in other things. I, I think those that spend time in the outdoors in whatever capacity, whether it's hiking with a group of Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or canoeing a river, uh, we have some tremendous streams in this, in this state that we can canoe, some wonderful hiking trails. Uh, University Press of Mississippi has published wonderful books about both you know, canoeing and 
and hiking, and I would encourage people to take a look at those because it may open up some new opportunities for them. But yes, you're exactly right. We're bound together by this common thread of love and appreciation and a, and a commitment to try to make things better for future generations. When we come back, we're going to talk more about his critically acclaimed book. Uh, we're having a wonderful visit with Donald Jackson. His book is called A Sportsman's Journey, and uh, and it, it really tells the story of Mississippi. You, you're, again, uh, I call this the capital of outdoors in America, that you can find certain aspects of the outdoors that may be better in other states, but when you add it all up, the, the waterways that we have access to, the offshore fishing, the delta, the hills of the northeast. I mean, you put it all together, and this is the capital of the outdoors in America. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation. See you after this break. on Mississippi's Outdoors. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors as we listen to our friend Steve Azar singing One Mississippi, the new state song for the state of Mississippi. What a great song it is. He's a, he's a really, really good friend and such a great ambassador for the state of Mississippi, Steve Azar. Hey, listen, we're having a conversation with Don Donald Jackson, who wrote a, a fantastic book that we're going to talk a lo little bit more about now called A Sportsman's Journey. But, Donald, you heard what I said at the beginning of the show. The, the, uh, the fact that you've, you've, been, uh, you've been all over the the world you've been on every continent of the in the world except antarctica uh, when i make the claim that we're the capital of the outdoors in mississippi that, that's a that's a uh, worthy claim isn't it i believe you're exactly on target uh <clears throat> I'll, I'll just give a little case in point people ask me why i left alaska i was on the faculty at university of alaska in fairbanks and I said, well, I loved Alaska and particularly loved the people. And they said, well, what about the hunting and fishing? And I said, well, I've done a lot of that. I've done a lot of big game hunting and fishing up there and been very successful with caribou and moose and bear and so forth and caught a lot of salmon and other things up there. But quite frankly, the, the uh, hunting and fishing is a whole lot better in Mississippi and it's a tremendously better place to go in terms of access. You can get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. I hear that a lot. And of course, you know, I can leave from like last weekend. We we left from here and went to a really sweet spot that we had. The weather finally worked for us. And 82 miles from my house, and the, the incredible fishing that takes place not only there at our destination where we were, somewhere near the mouth of the Mississippi River, uh, but on the way there and on the way back as we come across, you know, weed lines and. Uh, you might find a bucket out in the middle, middle of nowhere and find blackfish underneath it. I mean, it's just a, I mean, this is a special place. The backwaters of the coast of Mississippi and the red fishing and speckled trout. And then, of course, you get inland, some of the best crappie fishing in America, the bass fishing. I mean, I could just go on and on about that. But you're really, at the end of the day, your book is about that, but also the connection we have to that and why, how that comes about and why that's so special. And you're, the, I say critically acclaimed because those who have written reviews about your book say that it's nearly poetic. Uh, you've written other books, but what led to this book and, and what, what has the response been to this? Well, it's been a tremendous response. Uh, I've had, as you mentioned, some unexpectedly beautiful reviews. Uh, and I, I tell people that I don't write in order for it to be attractive to anyone. I write for the same reason that a fox leaves tracks in the snow. A uh, fox leaves tracks just because he's got to leave tracks, and I write because I don't have a choice. I love to write. It's, it's a way that I can express the things that are deep, deep, deep down in my soul. And I look at our hunting and our fishing and our other interactions with the outdoors almost in a sacrificial way. They're bridges that link us to something beyond ourselves in, in a beautiful, beautiful framework that uh, quite frankly, were it missing, I'm not sure there would be much reason to get out and do much of anything. Um, but this framework that we have, particularly in the Deep South and most specifically here in Mississippi, uh, is something that will surround us, grab us, hold us, give us a sense of direction and a sense of peace and, and 
help us understand that there's something bigger than us that we're a part of. Well, in a way, you know, it's interesting to study your, your story. And me having come from the publishing arena, and I've worked around Pulitzer Prize winning writers and art and and, and uh, editors, and in fact, at the Sun Hero, we won a Pulitzer after Hurricane Katrina. And by the way, there's a Hurricane Katrina connection that you and I have, and we'll come back to that in a second. But the, the reality is that uh, usually someone who works in a sort of a technical writing arena is not necessarily going to write a great book that someone would describe as poetic. But if you think about the fact that you were a preacher at one time in your, in your life, uh, the fact that you grew up loving the outdoors, you brought all those those things together and were able to, to write a book that, that people – really love writing and it excuse me love reading and they don't see it as a technical book it's it's really more of a book about the heart and soul isn't it it absolutely is and it's not a book about me doing things it's a book that i want to use to help share experiences with those who care to join me on the pilgrimage uh, i want people to feel like that whenever they pick up that book and turn in to turn the pages and get into a chapter that they're right there beside me and my responsibility is to use words to not only to paint a picture, but to create an aura, an aura uh, a sense of being that we're together on a common journey. And, uh, and so the, it's shared, it's a shared journey. And that's why I wanted to use the title of uh, Sportsman's Journey because it's not just about me, it's about us. And and so uh, as any artist, and I consider myself an artist that doesn't paint pictures with a brush, but with, with words, as any artist, we want to capture the imagination and that sense of soul that we have in, in whatever pursuit that we're involved with. Yeah, I've read I've read some terrific writers. Uh, one that comes to mind is Middleton, a book about fly fishing in North Carolina called On the Spine of Time. His ability to kind of put you in that moment, you know, to describe the fly and and help you understand that fly fishing isn't about the catching, it's about that experience. I think about Hemingway and the way he was able to write about his journeys into the outdoors. There's 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 a sense of responsibility that comes from writing in in that way. And uh, I'm curious, did you feel a strong sense of, of, of responsibility for this not to be a, about you per se, as you pointed out, but to really be about putting the reader in that experience so they can have a more significant connection, even if they've never experienced it before? Did you feel that responsibility? Absolutely. Uh, I take a lot of I expend a lot of effort just trying to make things right. But whenever I write one of these chapters, I can usually write it in a day if I'm left alone. And then I come back after it's chilled a little bit and fix it up. But I have a place over in Arkansas that I go hide out. And uh, I've been known to pour myself a cup of coffee uh, about 4.30 in the morning, start writing and get up to warm up that coffee and it's cold and it's mid-afternoon and I haven't moved. <laughs> writing that I had no sense of time because I felt such a tremendous responsibility for getting it right. Well, I love, I, well, first of all, that's a sign of a good writer, incidentally, this ability to sort of consume yourself in it. The fact that you have had the, the opportunity to travel the world and have a perspective about things, that perspective actually helps you greatly, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. It gives me a lot of contrast. And I, one of the things that I've want, that I have found worldwide is a sense of connectedness with people that are also engaged in the outdoors, regardless of where they may be, whether it be Central Australia or Southeast Asia or East Africa or up in Europe somewhere, South America. Uh, there are people that, whose hearts just throb beautifully whenever they're engaged in outdoor pursuits. And we find that sense of connectedness, even if our language abilities, our communications are somewhat limited, we can find those connections easily. A Sportsman's Journey strikes me as a book that is the perfect Christmas gift, <laughs> or maybe the perfect birthday present for someone who may not necessarily, hey, maybe they don't, even, maybe they're not enjoying the outdoors yet, or maybe it's someone who didn't get it from their father or grandfather, but someone special to that child 
knows that this book could actually help them learn why it's important for them to find an outdoors mentor to to take them to the outdoors. But it really is. It's, I, I could see it as the kind of book that sits on the uh, on a coffee table in a hunting camp, where people just pick it up from you know every chance they get in a quiet moment and read another chapter. Um, it has so many different applications, but I think it's you know the way I see it is that it's the kind of book that will be able to stand the test of time, and for generations to be able to connect people to the outdoors, whether they're directly engaged themselves or are wanting to be engaged. That's your hope, isn't it? It is, and you you said something that is so critical. It's not a book about how to do it, and it's not about me and, and a friend going off out in the woods and shooting something or catching something. It's more about why. Why are we out there? Yeah, yeah, why are we out there? It's, okay, look, we got a very short period of time left before we have to shift gears. Is there a part of the book that really – impacts you, that, that you really enjoyed writing, and it's just a favorite part? Well, the chapter that comes to mind is the very last chapter in the book. It's a story of me learning how to fly fish as a young boy and and with head and heart full of dreams, and it's about how that all happened. I, would record, I don't want people necessarily to start with the last chapter. The last chapter is my favorite. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes I do read a last chapter. I, as, what, as a as a publisher, I would say begin with the end in mind, and I kind of I kind of evaluate the book and do my little summary, and then I go back to the beginning of it and I just start taking it in page by page. That's just my approach. But listen, uh, it has been a pleasure to catch up with you, Donald Jackson, and I can tell you for sure that this is a conversation that will continue in the future as we in the future shows kind of dive into your book a little bit and tell some of the stories about why you believe this book has such a great connection, A Sportsman's Journey, the name of the book, a great connection to the outdoors, between the outdoors and our heart and soul. That's what it's all about. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us today, my friend. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You bet. Hey, listen, when we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Greg Sturdivant here shortly. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I really enjoyed that conversation with Don, uh, Donald Jackson. Uh, and I can't wait to uh, have more conversations with him about his book, A Sportsman's Journey. Uh, it is it is awesome to, to reflect on this connection we have, all of us have, so many of us have, between our heart and soul in the outdoors in Mississippi. We're very lucky to live in this incredible state. Now I'm going to shift gears and move over to my new friend, Dr. Grace Stutter, Sturdivant, who, uh, who has done some really interesting work. Uh, she's an audiologist, and she has uh, she, she grew up enjoying the outdoors. She spent some time in radio, for a matter of fact. <laughs> but, uh, but she's connected sort of her avid outdoors woman part of her to her professional side, which is uh, protecting people's ears. So without any further ado, let me welcome my friend Grace to uh, Coach, uh, excuse me, to Super Talk Outdoors. How are you doing, Thank Grace? Thank you. Thank you. Doing great. I've wanted to, to be on your show for quite some time. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. It's, it's good to see you. So tell us about Odo Pro Technologies. Sure. Odo Pro Technologies was born truly as a passion project for me. I never dreamed that it would scale to this level and continue to grow like it is. I was practicing audiology at the University of Mississippi Medical Center here in Jackson and uh, was diagnosing and treating hearing loss and then worked in research for a little while. And very long story short, became compelled to prevent the problems that I spent so many years diagnosing and treating after the damage had been done. And so my own father is my, you know, case zero, where I was, I knew there were these great options for hearing protection that could actually be enjoyable to wear when he's out hunting, but I couldn't get him to come make an appointment with me in the clinic and go through that medical model and then come back two weeks later to pick up his products. So I started Odo Pro as a little LLC so that I could go around to my friends' houses after work, show them their options, make the custom ear mold impressions where I inject the material in the ear and make a cast and then send that to the manufacturer, have things built to their specs and then drop shipped right to their mailbox a few weeks later. So Odo Pro at its essence is a customer service model 
uh, with a different service delivery than the way other people through the medical model are, are dispensing these types of hearing protection products. And since then, uh, we've grown. It, it, word of mouth, truly, organic word of mouth. I only started spending a little bit of money on marketing last year. We have um, an e-commerce portal now where people across the world can check out on our website. And then if I can't be there, obviously, to mold your ears myself, we have over 260, as of yesterday, clinic locations where we have audiologist relationships established with hearing care clinics locally for that person so that they can go get their ears molded for a nominal fee for that service that they pay to that provider. And then we facilitate all the product delivery and the follow-up care. So we're following up with people, making sure things fit and work and you're happy with it. We swap things out if they're not exactly what you wanted it to be. And at the end of the day, we're just making sure people have the best tools for them across a variety of models and price points to have their ears protected while they're doing these things they love. I, I love it. I wanted to get that out of the way to begin with so people can see it's kind of a framing of the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, what an innovative company. I speak. I spent a lot of time on my show on the coast called Coast View. We're talking to entrepreneurs and uh, really searching out innovation, what it's what it's like to have a small business and develop it into a bigger business and all the challenges that come with that. It's, it's very inspirational kind of hearing your story. Thank but you. let's take a step back for just a second. When I first heard about you and started doing my research on you, I, I kept I couldn't help but think about my own situation. My ears ring all the time. And the reason they ring all the time is because as a child, I played drums for many, many years, still kind of bang on them today. Um, and then shooting, shooting. You know, I've been out in the outdoors for, for most of my life and I didn't start wearing hearing protection. Of course, we didn't know what we know today, that your ear is this transmitter and there are some really delicate components in the, in the, uh, in, in the, inside the ear that help your brain ultimately hear. Your brain's the one that hears and the, as you point out, the, the, right. the ear is the transmitter. People don't take care of those really delicate <laughs> aspects of your ear that can be impacted by uh, very very, very loud noises, like, for example, right. listening to loud music or shooting a gun. And what they don't realize is that you hear that immediate ring, you think it's going to go away, but you've actually done some damage. So yeah. it's a it's an important it's an important conversation to have, and I think most people think about it. Why do you think it's not until you get is it is it is it not until you start to realize you've had hearing loss from your early experience? Why do you think we're sort of careless in, their, in the early stages of our lives? Well, I think that historically, we just weren't thinking about it. You know, just like we used to not think about seatbelts or, you know, helmets when you're riding a bicycle. These are things that as, as kids, we didn't do. And nobody, it wasn't because of our parental neglect. It just wasn't part of the conversation. I mean, take it a step further and you could smoke and drink the whole time you were pregnant. It's just, you don't know what you don't know. And I like to compare hearing loss as a cumulative effect over time of all the noise you're exposed to, even if it's not a really loud blast like a gunshot, or even if you're not a concert goer standing front center, just the accumulation of noise over a lifetime is going to impact your hearing, similar to sun exposure. And, and I like to uh, compare hearing loss that shows up in your 40s and 50s to the sun exposure because, you know, I would, I would get a really bad sunburn. I would bake in the sun at the pool in the summer and just try to get as tan as possible. And sometimes I'd have a really bad sunburn that would peel and be really red and blistered. But then when you're young and beautiful, your, your skin heals and then you look fresh as a daisy again. And now that I'm knocking on 40's door, I'm seeing all these lines and where did these sunspots come from? And it's because of that molecular damage that I was doing that looks to have healed the same way that you might have ringing for a day and then it goes away and you think you're fine. Well, it was doing, it was doing a little bit of damage every time and then it does catch up with us, it, typically in our 40's and 50's. So let's talk. Let's talk about the the physical structure of the ear for a second. So, if someone shoots a gun, is that about 150 decibels? Is that about normal or, or usually louder? One, usually 140 to 160. But if you've got yeah. a muzzle break or a ported barrel, it's going to be even more than that. Okay, you make that. You make that shot. Uh, you feel a slight hearing uh, ringing in the ear when you make it. You not have. You don't have hearing protection. Tell people what happens inside the ear when that happens. 
Yeah, so the sound travels through this external funnel here on the outside of your ear, goes through the ear canal, vibrates the eardrum, which vibrates these little middle ear bones that are connected to your cochlea, which is the little two and a half turn snail shell organ of hearing. And that's where these delicate nerve fibers are kind of standing on end, situated on a, a membrane, and it's a fluid filled space. As the sound comes in, it's, it's physically knocking down those hair cells. And with some things as loud as a gunshot, those hair cells, it knocks them down so hard, they're not immediately coming right back up to be on alert again. And that's where that immediate ringing comes in. And then hopefully those hair cell fibers are gonna recover, 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 but you've weakened them undoubtedly. But then that's not where you hear. The, those hair cell fibers are just creating the action potential to send to your brain to be processed. And that's where you hear is in your brain. So when you're lacking auditory stimulation from a hearing loss, you're actually creating some uh, lack of stimulation in those areas of your brain that are dedicated to processing sound. And that's, that's more of the concern even than that cochlear damage. So you think about you think about what you did early in your career as a doctor of audiology, working on sort of diagnosing hearing loss, you know, trying to prescribe some approach for people to be able to hear better right. uh, in their years going forward. And this this big this big focus that you just kind of switched mm -hmm. to hearing protection. So, you know, again, you you were raised in the outdoors. You've been around shooting sports. And you 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 love music, and we haven't talked much about that. But um, but you, you know, it this opportunity you have now to be proactive and to s sort of send a message to people that they better pay attention to this. The technology is there for us to pay more attention to it. We understand it better. We know where the damage comes from and we know how to protect people in ways that we didn't before. That's gotta be kind of a, a, an important move in your life. And it's, it sounds to me like you've dedicated your life to it. I, I mean, this is a calling for me. Like I say, it started as a passion project, not a business plan. And the, there, there still is no set business plan. The business plan is to keep doing what works and pivot away from what doesn't, and we'll see where this thing goes. And that's worked pretty well so far. My husband, who's the MBA, and and it cr cringes when I start talking about this because I've never taken a business or an accounting class, but I studied the heck out of ears and how we hear. And that that's what this business is based on. Um, I'm also, I feel very fortunate to be able to have a large charitable component where I'm on the board at Magnolia Speech School, where we're empowering children that are born with hearing loss and communication problems to mainstream into normal classrooms as soon as they're able to. Um, this Odo Pro Technologies business is the most rewarding, aside from my children and my family, the most rewarding blessing of my life. Um, I get emails uh, like just, just over the weekend, I received a couple of emails from people who have been inspired to take proactive measures to protect their hearing and to um, go seek the medical referrals that I've sent them to so that they can take a better approach and prevent problems down the road. That, that's the most rewarding thing I can imagine. When we come back, we're going to continue the conversation about ear protection. I really want to hear a little bit more about her outdoor experiences along the way. But this is Grace Sturdivant, and we'll see you on the other side. We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the outdoors. So let's talk about it. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. We're talking with Dr. Grace Sturdivan. She's an audiologist and she literally, as you heard in the first part of this part of the show, she literally has dedicated her life to a new company she calls Odo Pro Technologies. And uh, you know, it's a very sort of uh, tailored approach to working with clients to help them find the best approach to protecting their hearing, whether you're hunting or enjoying the outdoors or doing something else that involves you know, loud sounds that could affect your long-term hearing uh, ability. Um, you know, I want to take a step back for a bit, Grace. Um, who taught you a love of the outdoors? Oh, my dad. Jay Gore from Grenada, Mississippi. 
he uh, has been, he, he's a lifelong hunter himself, an outdoorsman and conservationist, and spent a lot of time growing up with him at the hunting camp. And much to his chagrin, I never had much of a desire to do the actual hunting with him, but I was around it all the time. And I, I think back to what I'm doing now, and I smile thinking about, there's so much surrounding the hunting community that's more than just the hunt itself. Uh, the conservation efforts, but also just the social camaraderie and gathering around that campfire at the end of the day where people are telling their stories and sharing about that experience and making those memories that they pass down for generations. And you see grandkids out there with their parents and grandparents. And what I'm trying to do is continue enabling people to take part in those conversations while they're still getting out there and doing the, doing the thing. So I'm very steeped in it. And what my dad did more than anything is instill a respect and an appreciation for what hunting is, which is a whole lot more than just a recreational sport. Yeah, it is. It, it is. It is life. <laughs> You're literally participating in life. And for yeah. people who, you know, people who see it as just shooting something. They they completely missed the point I mean, because I, I think some of my best deer seasons, I can look back and I never pulled the trigger. Just right. to, as you pointed out, you know, the getting ready for hunting season, the the incredible camaraderie that happens both inside the hunting season and, and even before the hunting season starts, the ability to pass it on to the kids. And as I said in the first half of our show with uh, Donald Jackson, um, you know, the, this incredible ability to pass that on to your kids and your kids' kids that a family that enjoys the outdoors together stays together. But you truly got to experience that. I did. I did. And I, and I still do, thankfully. Uh, and and I, I don't think anything I could have done with my career would make my dad more proud than what I'm doing now, being so involved. I mean, he's uh, pleasantly surprised that I'm that I've ended up in this outdoors space, in this outdoors world. So yeah. getting, getting to meet some of these amazing people that are doing incredible things in this space uh, is pretty cool for him to be able to see. So you, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, show Stephen uh, Ranella, uh, who has the Meat Eater show on TV, and he's got a podcast. Uh, I have followed him for years ago. I think his TV show is one of the best sort of outdoor shows because he's so smart. You had the opportunity to be on his show. Yeah. When you're on someone like Stephen's show, it has a way of sort of putting you on the map, doesn't it? Oh, my word. Um, you know, I, I first met them back in March. Uh, Chef Jean-Paul hosts the show Duck Camp Dinners as a contributor for the Meat Eater umbrella. And he made the introduction and allowed me to have um, what was supposed to be a 20-minute block one-on-one -on -one with Steve Ranella, which turned into two hours of us. And it ended with him saying, I think we need to continue this conversation on the podcast. And every, I think that a prerequisite to be involved with the Meat Eater franchise is to have an expert IQ, like off the charts. These guys are smart and they're driven and they're they're very principled about what they do. It's incredibly inspiring for me to continue working with them. And um, thankfully, they've been very interested in my business model as a mission instead of a product push. And yeah. I think that's what they truly got on board with. But man, they asked some really great questions and it makes for fascinating dialogue that could truly go on all day long. So, Grace, when you think about your approach, uh, Odo Pro technology, you think about your approach, it's not, it's your, you, aren't rec you aren't representing a specific brand. That's You're right. willing to turn on the dime based on the latest technology. And what's interesting about if you look in, into this area of uh, ear protection, gosh, man, it's like been exponential improvements in the technology that's available. Uh, over the last few years, uh, and you really got to stay up on it because it's constantly, it's you know, a constant tweaking. Study, and that's where you know I'm not doing any hearing aid business with my with Odo Pro, it, because it takes my entire bandwidth of of myself and my team to be constantly studying what's coming out from around the globe. Um, I'm watching a product right now that's ho I'm hopeful it's going to come from the UK in the next little bit. 
Um, but you know, if it had been a business p plan and not a passion project, I would have aligned myself to be a, a rep for a certain company. Uh, but I'm refusing to do that because I want the flexibility to be able to source anything as long as it's the most appropriate option for you. I think it's so innovative, and and you're 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 smart, and you're you're a joy to talk to, and you love the outdoors. So we're right. going to come back and visit again in the near future. This has been Dr. Grace Sturdivant, and uh, you know we'll talk more about here in production. We can't say that enough. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. Have a great day and stay safe. We'll see you next Monday.